So this has been a, a few years in coming, but we're, we're glad to welcome David Strolnik to the uh, Soil and Nutrition Conference stage. Um, people may uh, have been touched by some of the interesting information coming out of Europe in the past couple of weeks. Um, this David's been working around the world um, identifying um, well-functioning systems, cultural, environmental, um, economic, health. Um, and so there's some really interesting patterns he's found through his work. I think that's what his agenda is to share with us today. Um, what are the what are the common threads um, that seem to cause success? Um, and nutrition is part of that circle. So um, yeah, I'm not sure if you want to give you give a, a background of your of your your professional career and work, or just or just jump right into it. But that's uh, w welcome and glad to have you. Glad to have you here. Thank you, Dan. Um, yes. Happy to be here. Yeah, let me give a, a quick intro, but it's it's a pleasure to see you online. I wish we could see each other in person. Um, I think we met four years ago at the BFA conference um, for the first time. And um, I guess briefly, so, so I lead an organization called Nourish to the Nth, Nourish to the Nth Degree, the Nourishment Economies Coalition which is a group of uh, independent social and business enterprises in a, in a bunch of different countries, including the United States, um, who share the common um, foundation of, of uh, regenerating and sustaining and growing themselves and their impact in the world based on the nutritional relationship between the earth and humans. Uh, so we'll get into that some more. Um, uh, personally, I just, you know, I've spent almost 30 years um, helping organize mostly environmental initiatives uh, in, in, in a bunch of places in somewhere around 30 countries. Um, I've got a couple degrees in political science and public policy and environmental economics from some well-known universities. Um, I come from a teeny tiny high mountain town in the, in the high desert west of the United States. Um, and I, I, I currently have the privilege of, of uh, working in, uh, I'll call it owning, but stewarding about eight acres of, of farmland in Maine in the US, uh, where I do a lot of my learning and trying to apply a lot of the stuff that I get to share with others around the world. Um, so that's me, but, but I'm not the point of this. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, as Dan said, talk about what I think of as the economics of these regenerative or what we call nourishment cycle enterprises. Um, and I'll explain that in a sec. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start up a PowerPoint presentation and share my slides and just kind of talk through them. It'll take a little while. Uh, that includes an introduction. And then I think I have 14 different examples of the people I get to work with in different parts of the world. Um, draw a couple of conclusions based on the patterns we see amongst those and then stop and uh, happy to discuss or chew on or argue about or reflect on any anything that occurs to anybody who's who's watching today. Um, so thank you for coming and, and, and considering these thoughts and I hope that you know some of the information I can share is useful for for you. Um, one, one, one more thought as I fire up the PowerPoint, which is I think it's important to recognize that there's different audiences for this work. And what I mean by that is there's growers and farmers, there's investors or philanthropic funders, there's public policymakers, and there's technologists. And I think that the message out of what I'd like to share uh, is distinct perhaps for each of you, each of those different audiences. But there's a common foundation, again, we're going to keep seeing it over and over, which is how nutrients cycle between the earth and people and back again, and how creative, energetic, change-minded, systemic thinking people can, can, uh, can act on the many, many social and environmental benefits that come out of successful cycling of nutrients. So um, one sec, I'm going to start at the PowerPoint. Um, so this is the organization I lead, Nourish to the Nth Degree. Uh, we were founded in 2016 by me after about 10 or 12 years of work uh, 
primarily with social entrepreneurs of either the organization Ashoka or the Skull Foundation or a couple of others around the world. Um, as I said, uh, today I'm gonna to talk about what I call economics. Um, that is to say, I'm not necessarily going to talk about uh, the moral imperative to sustain life and a rich life on earth. I'm looking at my notes too. Or why we need to do that or the science that underlies it or, uh, or the fighting and hopefully the defeating of others who are in the business of extracting the wellness and the wealth from the earth and from other communities um, with the goal of making a financial profit for themselves or their shareholders. That's not what I'm talking about today. That doesn't mean I don't subscribe to those values, but Dan and I wanted to, to really focus in on, on the economics that make some of these initiatives and enterprises succeed. Um, so if we were gonna have that other discussion, um, you know, uh, you'd still hear me highlighting these economic forces as, as one of the driving factors that all of us can, I think, deploy for, for making change. Um, there's a few characteristics of, of these uh, types of enterprises that I wanna point out, and then we're gonna dive into these examples, which is basically these five things that, that what we're doing is looking at groups I get to work with that are, um, you know, that stimulate circular or regenerative economics by combining financial, but also social and environmental benefits. Uh, they tend to escalate the vitality of both people and the surrounding ecosystems they operate in as they work. Uh, they foster universally a sense of agency and creativity in individuals and communities who, who, who they work with which then stimulates an ongoing stream of innovation that's very community centered. Um, and a common thread in all of this is nutrition, linking people and soils. Um, what I wanna observe at the outset is that this common thread of linking, of nutrition linking people and soils was not our guiding principle. It's not what we started with. It's the result of looking at enterprises that succeed in regenerating human and ecological systems. We spent about 10 or 12 years looking around the world for rural innovators who are really changing systems and succeeding and begin to ask, why are they succeeding? What's going on? Uh, succeeding in terms of supporting the people and the earth, sustaining themselves, financially and otherwise, what's going on? How come these very creative kind of enterprises, and, and I'll highlight one, uh, our, our friend Rehi, who has keynoted this conference, is the kind of social entrepreneur that I'm talking about. But what's going on? Lots of things are going on, but a very common theme across many countries and many models is that these social entrepreneurs, these enterprisers, these community change makers are managing to capture and put into play enough of the benefits that come out of linking nutrients and nutrition in soils and people in order to sustain and grow whatever it is they're doing. Thus, I met Dan Kittredge and the Bionutrient Food Association a few years ago. Um, not as a thesis of our work, but as an analytic result of studying what actually works around the world. So I hope that makes sense. Um, Thanks for considering. I'm going to dive into 14 examples now and uh, spend two or three minutes just, just giving a snapshot of each example. Uh, these are illustrative. I don't have time to give all the details. Uh, I would highlight that I get to work with each of the individuals we're going to talk about and, um, and uh, happy to entertain questions or, or you know, go deeper into any of them. But I wanted to give you a, an overview. So I picked 14 out of our network of around 200. Uh, 14 of the, you know, the most exciting ones, um, but they're all pretty exciting. So um, here we go. Uh, what we're looking at here is, is, is two from Ireland across the pond. One is, is uh, the burn program started by Brendan Dunford, who we see here. Basically, the, 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 the example is that uh, Brendan 
uh, in summary, set out to try to restore wildflower biodiversity in Western Ireland, where many of Western cultures, famous poets uh, did their reflecting and wrote their poetry. And where he saw in his own homeland, um, degradation of the landscape uh, for a number of reasons over years, in part driven by the economic pressures of sheep farming. And he set out, and I, again, with each of these examples, I won't go through all the details, but he basically set out to try to reverse that, and it's been pretty successful. The, the end of this story is one where um, Brendan and his team have managed to put into play some, some stewardship with the sheep farmers that encourages them to improve wildflower biodiversity on their property each year through some pretty simple mechanisms. Uh, basically, uh, by showing three sets of photographs and a little bit of data each year to each farmer, and by offering them a cash reward, a cash payback based on how well their landscape matched each of the three uh, different scenarios in these three photographs. One with uh, rich traditional wildflower diversity, one with let's just call it medium diversity, and one that's not looking too good. And the farmer basically receives a cash payment based on what their farm looks like. And then uh, Brendan in brief says, thank you. See you next year. Comes back next year and does the same thing. Uh, I'm being very simplistic about it, but uh, what we see is that the farmers by and large begin to work to restore the wildflowers. Uh, the cash payment from Brendan's team is not large, but it's not tiny. And uh, one of the economic dynamics we see, a couple of them, is that the um, the cash payment is rationalized by a lot of the farmers, uh, not for its monetary value in and of itself exclusively, but because it also sort of provides some social justification in modern society where there's a lot of tension to, you know, maximize your financials. Uh, provide some justification to go back and look at how grandpappy used to do things and, and restore some of the land and value some of the cultural heritage um, in addition to the very important goal of making enough money to, to feed your family and support your community. Uh, what we see triggered, however, is even more interesting economically, which is that as this begins to work, uh, tourism begins to return to certain parts of Western Ireland where this is happening and tourism focused in part on the wildflowers and in part on the, uh, the, the, the heritage of the poetry of the burren. And so while an individual farmer may not uh, make quite as much money as they could have if they had intensively grazed their sheep in the extractive way, the community as a whole starts doing better. And so now you see a sort of a beautiful harmony between the economic welfare of the community and the stewardship by the farmers. Um, and so the economic equation is not one just of the farmer herself or his self, but of the entire region, the locality uh, of the earth and the people working together and the rest of Ireland and, and people from elsewhere supporting them. I hope that makes sense. Um, it's sort of a long-winded example, but I wanted to sort of illustrate some of the dynamics that we, we observe over and over again. Um, again, we can return to any of these. Uh, the next one, I'll be a little, a little more succinct with the rest. Um, some of you may know of Mick Kelly, grow it yourself. Uh, I started working with him about 10 years ago. Uh, his focus has been on getting people to grow their own piece of food for the first time ever. Uh, in the year 2020, they reached about, it looks like 900,000 people. Uh, it wasn't always that way, but something's working here. And what I wanna point out and uh, is a couple of lessons from Mick's work. Some of you may know him now from his, his popular TV show, which has also hit our country in the US. Um, uh, but his grow it yourself uh, stewardship, his, 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 his uh, kits and informational services and the Importantly, the networking between these gardeners um, 
so just two thoughts. Uh, one, so 900,000 people in 2020, uh, clearly a force large enough now to be influencing supermarket procurement policies towards organic foods, uh, to be attracting the attention of the national government in Ireland, especially in the era of the pandemic regarding uh, secure and resilient food systems, um, uh, started by getting individuals to just grow their own piece of food for the first time. Uh, an insight from Mick's work, I want to point out that, that he shared with me oh, about eight, eight years ago was a real breakthrough moment in this work where um, people's first seed they planted ever, like a lot of home gardening initiatives, weren't really growing that well. And people were getting discouraged. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm characterizing, uh, simplifying. Um, and a real insight that Mick and his team had was the importance of, 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 of the social network, of establishing in a neighborhood, for example, a group of people, all of whom were trying to grow their own seed for the first time, to grow their own piece of food for the first time. And it sounds, if I understand correctly, like it's really that social connection between individuals discovering the thrills and the trauma of trying to grow your own tomato for the first time and tasting it and sharing that with each other that really popped open what has become a really powerful force uh, in Ireland today. So there's a subtlety to the economics of what's making some of it succeed, which again has now had some pretty major impact on um, commercial food procurement in supermarkets and, and elsewhere. Um, moving on, let's come back to the United States. Wolf's Neck Center, USA. Many of you know Wolf's Neck, certainly the Bionutrient Food Association does. I just, uh, uh, this is about 10 miles from my own little farm. Uh, I wanna point out the, some things that, are, that, that converge there. One is uh, you know, a, a, a beautiful place that converges different forces. That's something pointed out by the executive director of Wolfsnag. It's a beautiful place and it attracts people. Uh, they are producing local foods, foods for local markets organically. They are doing scientific research on nutrition and greenhouse gases, uh, extending for example into uh, how seaweed worked into feed for cattle, reduces methane emissions and, 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 and studying how it affects the nutrient qualities of the milk that's produced. They train young farmers. Uh, they have tourists who come uh, in summer camps and to their local campground uh, to, to be in this beautiful place and to share in these practices and to eat magnificent food and to have fun. Uh, and they're doing R&D work, including with, you know, Doreen Cox and others who've been mentioned in this conference. Um, um, so what are the economics of Wolf's Neck Center? It's, I think a big piece of it is that, is that none of these single lines of action were sufficient to sustain Wolf's Neck in and of itself uh, over many years. But now that at least these five forces are all operating in conjunction, a lot of really cool, powerful things are happening there. Um, flip over to South Africa. Again, I'm just gonna rattle through these examples for, for a little while um, and then and hope you can extract questions or, or thoughts or insights. Um, in a place called South Africa, this man whose name is Ashley worked with the local community in an area that was um, largely left out of the reparations that followed the apartheid era because of a sort of a unique legal status and sort of an in-between status. Uh, it's a fairly remote community called Kata. It's beautiful. Um, and uh, it's at the end of a, of a long road, a long one-way road. Um, the short story here is that the people there began to cultivate some of their own food so they didn't have to drive that long bumpy road to retrieve food from external markets. They began to grow their own food um, again in an era where they had recovered some of their freedoms um, after you know traumatic political, social, cultural repression. Um, they begin to have tourists showing up because there's a beautiful forest and there are rare and, and, and magnificent wild birds and bird watchers begin to come. And when bird watchers begin to come, now that they have some food to offer those tourists, they built a little eco lodge and the tourists begin to stay and that begin to generate some economy in the community aside from just laboring um, to live, to survive. Um, 
This grew into the Eagle Lodge. This grew into a lot of questions about the cultural heritage of the area, which led to some decisions to build a heritage trail through the hills to show where the families used to live and the farms used to be pre-apartheid, um, which led to the, it sort of coincided with the establishment of a, of a local cultural museum. That also led to the discovery by some people of uh, brown trout in that little river you see flowing by. And uh, some of you may know that when you discover brown trout in a wild river somewhere, then some more tourists show up. They often tend to be fairly wealthy. They like to catch trout and then put them back in the water. You know, fly fishermen are a fascinating group and um, I'm one of them, so I can, I can reflect a little bit. So kata, I guess my point is that by local people starting up a local food economy for themselves, not even economy, just starting to provide their own food, uh, has developed into uh, a community managed, uh, regenerative, socially, culturally, ecologically regenerative, beautiful place on earth. Um, I highly recommend a visit if anyone ever uh, uh, has cause to go to South Africa or anyone wants to um, find a destination for, for, for the experience. All right, back to Europe and the United States. Biodiversity. Um, so here's what biodiversity, which is from Belgium, does. Uh, and I, I have to disclose in advance that I now, uh, so, so my organization is now the US rep of biodiversity. And I'll explain in a minute a service that we just started offering. Um, basically, uh, biodiversity can look at your piece of land, your two or three square mile site, whether you are a farm, a vineyard, a uh, urban park, an industrial site, a corporate site, a city park, a construction site, uh, and tell you uh, the identity and parts per million concentration of any of over 580 chemical compounds that are present on that site, and can tell you with incredible data precision, and can then work with you to do a very quick and accurate risk assessment of uh, whether any of those chemical compounds that are present uh, pose a threat to ecological or human health, to biodiversity, uh, basically by looking at what they are, what the half-lives are, what their proximity to humans or water systems, et cetera. Um, in addition, biodiversity can report back to you the genus and species of every flowering plant on your site. And uh, how? Uh, how is by partnering with bee colonies. Uh, biodiversity developed the technology in the laboratory in Belgium to uh, look at the pollen that bees collect and as they range and gather literally millions of data points per month and analyze that and report back to you what's on your property and what trends are on your property if you want to measure, let's say, once a month or once a year, and the effectiveness of any uh, remediation that you might undertake. So let's say we discover something that we don't like. And uh, for example, in a set of uh, a farm, uh, an organic farming region in France, uh, it was discovered that it wasn't organic, that there were a number of pesticides present that surprised the farmers until they, through biodiversity, were able to trace it back to home gardeners in town who were using uh, things that, that, that uh, conflicted with the organic protocols and standards that the farmers adhered to. So the farmers worked with the community on different practices. They reduced the number of pesticides being used. They tested again a year later and there was a drop. I don't remember the percentage, but a very large drop in the number of chemical pesticides being used. We have a number of cases of farmers themselves because of this data set, this very transparent data set beginning to collaborate and at least standardize around a couple of interventions they needed to maintain their, their commercial success. Um, we have examples of this kind of transparent data set, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, being used to convene multiple stakeholders in a community or a region who usually wouldn't have gotten around the table together. Uh, so we just demonstrated this in the United States for the first time at two different sites in the state of Maine. Uh, really fun and interesting results, one with the Kennebec Estuary Land Trust and one with the Maine Audubon Society. 
Um, and we just uh, started our first commercial biodiversity project in North America, uh, looking at potential pollutants in uh, fishery salmon spawning grounds on the Klamath River watershed in Northern California. Um, it's fun and interesting uh, and very powerful stuff. Um, thanks for the bees. And by the way, we're supporting pollinators, but we're not supporting pollinators as a charity, right? In this case, uh, they're a business partner uh, and they're very powerful. Um, over on the right, we see Sean Sherman, the sous chef. Some of you may know him. Uh, been working with him for five or six years on and off. Um, he, Sean is pioneered based in Minnesota, uh, but also around the country, the sort of the return to focusing on indigenous foods as a cultural connector and as a health and nutrition connector for both indigenous communities and for uh, the rest of us who love, love good food and value the earth uh, and, and the history and ancestry of our own peoples. Um, I think we're about halfway through the list. Uh, on the left, in Zambia, let's go to Africa. Dale Lewis, um, um, perhaps, perhaps our uh, biggest impact uh, example. Uh, I get to work with Dale very closely. Um, Dale runs a food company, Dale and his team, in a rural area with local communities. Uh, they produce 17 different natural nutritious food products that you see in this picture from peanut butter to breakfast cereals and a couple of other things. Um, the key insight here in this very remote region um, is that uh, the company, Kamako, which stands for Community Markets for Conservation, uh, now has active working relationships with over 220,000 small farmers in the region. And those are relationships because those 220,000 small farmers are finding immense value in working with this company because of the business practices and the way they operate. Um, Kamako earns revenue to pay the bills in three ways. Uh, and, uh, and, and I should say as context produces about 10,000 tons of commercial food products per year now, which are sold largely in urban markets. Um, and it just started being exported to South Africa and to the United States. The first container of, of, of uh, food is, the, the, the brand name is It's Wild. So you can go to www.itswild.org. Um, and um, part of the key here is that, um, is that they produce and sell food that generates income in urban areas that provides an incentive to rural small farmers to grow in conservation sensitive ways. Part of the, of the, of the, of the, of the intelligence and, and magic of Kamako is that they, um, they will only procure foods from those farmers that those farmers agree to follow conservation farming practices. And we can discuss what that means in Zambia, but it's 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 basically this you know similar, you know, uh, no till, no chemicals, or reduced chemicals, uh, using agroforestry with with nitrogen fixing trees, uh, over thirty million Glaricidia sepium trees now planted in the Kamako Range, of over about forty thousand square miles. Um, but in addition to requiring that the farmers who they buy product from follow conservation practices, they then, Kamako then further rewards those farmers for those practices. So separate from the, the price that's paid for some crops, uh, all of the farmers are part of community associations. Uh, I, th I think there's 86 total currently. Um, and each community association is provided a conservation dividend payment each year based on its own effectiveness at, at conserving local forests and wildlife. Um, and so where does that money come from? That money comes from carbon, international carbon sales, because Kamako is the first organization, I believe, in the world, starting several years ago, working with the World Bank Prototype Carbon Fund to aggregate the carbon impact of hundreds of thousands of small farmers into a single, uh, a single transactable uh, uh, you know, uh, carbon offering. So the carbon offering now that's sold each year 
is used to compensate the communities as the conservation dividend they receive for conservation agriculture, aside from the actual price they receive for the crops they grow. Um, uh, I would note that uh, just as an aside, there's a group in California called the Mycelium Fund. Uh, some of you may know who have provided recently a, a, a very generous matching fund to help incentivize the replication of Kamaka for the first time in a new region in Western Zambia. Um, and so I think there's still about $60,000 available for matching other contributions. So I am shamelessly promoting Kamako in this case. If anyone listening um, has an interest in this model or in helping steward and replicate, it's, it's really phenomenal successes. Um, please go to itswild.org or contact me. Um, okay, down to Ecuador. The Quito Water Trust Fund and Marta Echeverria and her team. What I wanted to point out here is that is that their team uh, developed a financial model that basically uh, and organized a, a financial mechanism that, that enabled big water consumers in the city of Quito, uh, including municipal agencies and private companies to, to fund watershed protection through regenerative or at least sustainable farming practices way upriver because Marta and her team and others were able to demonstrate that if the farmers upstream conserve the watershed, then the water arrives more consistently and cleaner downstream in the city. And the city itself has to spend less money cleaning up the water. And so uh, while clearly there are social and environmental uh, undertones, this is a financial transaction. Big city water consumers pay rural farmers to maintain the watershed at substantial scale. Um, uh, the, the, by the way, the Nature Conservancy, who also worked with Marta, this was, this was quite a few years ago when she, she and, and, and their team first developed this, but has, has uh, institutionalized and tried to, tried to begin to spread this approach. Um, back to Zambia, uh, Sylvia Banda, the woman on the left. My friend Sylvia um, uh, runs a restaurant and food catering business that tra transacts only in traditional native foods. And uh, as of a few years ago, a food processing and packaging business uh, of those same foods. Uh, at the scale of now uh, sourcing their, their traditional ingredients from approximately 23,000 small women farmers around the country, which to me is a big number. Um, and the insight here, other than this is a purely a, a business initiative. I mean, Sylvia can take grants sometimes for doing things like farmer training, but she's running a commercial enterprise, almost an empire at this point. Maybe it's not that big, but um, you know what, what, what Sylvia says keyed her in part into wanting to promote traditional foods commercially in her country is that when she was a child, she witnessed famine in her country. And then she witnessed the onslaught of Western style processed foods. And along with the, the onslaught of Western processed foods came a, a decrease in local traditional farming skills and knowledge. And Sylvia was very worried that famine would return, that the Western hamburger salespeople would leave town and there would be famine again. So Sylvia set out with a traditional foods restaurant to try to at least maintain some traditions, justify sourcing food from some small traditional farmers. Fast forward, 23,000 now supply her, 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 her food company. Um, so uh, she's a real inspiration. She's a real charmer. She's got her, she's, she's, she's just she's great to work with. Incidentally, Sylvia came to the US and joined me a couple of years ago in some of our work uh, in the Southwest US in the, with the um, Navajo and Hopi communities, Native American communities. Uh, and we've had a, a, a really interesting impact of that journey that Sylvia joined us on. We called it a nourishment entrepreneurship journey. Um, we'll get into a little bit of that later. 
um, down in South Africa, EPAP. Um, short story here being, this is on the health side of the story, uh, retired chemist uh, named Basil Kranzdorf, who you see in the top left of this photograph. Um, um, God rest his soul, Basil passed away a couple of years ago. Um, basically, uh, it, it created, invented a food supplement, a powdered food supplement that uh, he demonstrated that when, when it was used in medical clinics, uh, I think they were tuberculosis, though I'm not quite sure, um, a lot, uh, alongside a traditional regimen of medicines, uh, that the patients who consumed this food responded more effectively to the medicines than patients who did not consume this additional product to their, to their regular diet. And uh, we can get into the details, but uh, when it comes down to it, uh, a couple stories I wanted to share about the success of this product. Um, one is that uh, when first challenged to, to, to explain how it works and why it works, Basil, as a highly accomplished chemist, basically said, look, it's all organic. It's all unrefined. All the stuff is left in this product that we don't really know what it does for you nutritionally in terms of studying your microbiome, in terms of fiber in your diet. Today, we have these words. You know, a decade ago, Basil just knew he was using natural ingredients and it was working. He couldn't justify originally. He couldn't, he couldn't scientifically demonstrate why or how it worked. He was therefore shunned by some mainstream institutional players. But Basil, uh, he told me um, it's, uh, uh, at a conference we organized in Germany about, I don't know, eight years ago, um, he didn't really care. You know, there's babies starving. There's babies dying of malnutrition and sickness. And the scientists can go justify what they want later. They can figure out why it works later. We got life, lives to save and people to support. And if we can do it through organic food production, all the better. Um, now it turns out a bunch of years later, uh, some mainstream institutions, including the World Food Program, I think, um, and others begin to procure the product and to work with Basil because it works. And they agree, we'll figure out the science over time. I haven't updated in, in more than a couple of years, so I don't know the current status of, of the product, um, uh, but it's a pretty important story, I think, coming and a commercial success. Uh, coming from the health side of the story, not the ecology or the farming side of, uh, of our story. Um, Nigeria, Blessing Mene, is the man here who uh, basically created a virtuous cycle um, amongst many things that he does uh, as a nutritional scientist. Um, a little, a virtuous cycle between very small scale, street scale restaurants that serve uh, fish, uh, amongst other products in their street stands. But, he, but what he did was he began to, to collect the food waste, to use that food waste to breed protein-rich insects, which were then used as the feed for the fish in the fish ponds that produce the fish, which are then cycled back to the same restaurants, which they sell commercially the waste of which is then cycled back into the feedstock for the insect production, which provides the protein to the fish. Uh, it's a beautiful little economic cycle. Um, uh, not big, not corporate, not centrally managed uh, in, a, in, in a way that does anything other than really help steward the local community vitality um, through nutrient cycles, right? Uh, down on the right, Totally different scale, multi-form harvest, United States, corporate, corporate farm entity working with big food processing, uh, who uh, uh, the, the, the example here is basically, I, I think they started working with, with potato, I'm gonna say French fries, though I could be making that up in, in Idaho, um, to take the waste stream from, you know, let's say the potato skins and instead of uh, paying the fees they had to pay to dispose of those wastes into the municipal waste stream uh, to develop a process for extracting in a, in a, in a benign way the phosphorus from, from that agricultural waste. 
from their food processing operation. To crystallize it into what's called struvite, some of you probably know a lot more than I do technically about what that means. Um, and then to um, basically use that as a, a feed stock into their own fertilizer supply. They're still using essentially a, a synthesized fertilizer, but now they're manufacturing it themselves based on the waste of their own food product production. They were able to save money by no longer paying such high waste disposal fees and no longer having to procure uh, the volume of uh, synthetic chemical fertilizers that they used to. Here we see garbage to gardens in the United States. Again, those of you in the Northeast might be familiar with them. What I want to point out is, you know, a, a consumer can uh, buy the bucket, put out their bucket of food waste, garbage to garden comes and picks it up each day uh, or each week, sorry. And um, if you've paid the subscription fee, they drop off a, a equal sized bucket of, of really rich compost for you to use in your own garden. Um, what they do is they, they collect this household food waste, they take it to a central farm site, they compost at a very large scale. Um, they produce enough compost to redistribute to the consumers who are paying them on the front end to collect the food waste and on the other end for the compost. And there's a surplus of compost and there's a large enough surplus of compost that it creates a commercial revenue stream, uh, both for farms and, uh, and some, if I understand correctly, some biofuel and soap production. Uh, so now look at the number collecting 21 tons of household food waste daily in an economically viable enterprise that is uh, serving up rich compost to, to home gardeners and commercial farms, organic farms in Maine and Massachusetts as well. Um, they won a couple of years ago a big US EPA award. I don't know all the details, but it was fun to see them get some national attention. Um, so now we're in this, we're in the realm of, of a piece of what my organization calls nourishment economies, right? Um, we're seeing that nutrient cycling isn't just on the production side from the earth to the humans, but these examples like garbage to gardens begin to highlight some of the opportunity at the, at the nutrient waste back into the earth side of the story at, at substantial scale. We're going to go down to the country of Haiti for a minute, or an organization called Soil. Um, uh, basically, in the in the post earthquake years in Haiti, uh, amidst the many problems uh, and devastation that those uh, people in Haiti began to suffer, uh, was the spread of cholera and other diseases. And so Sasha Kramer, the founder of Soil. Uh, again, long story short, uh, created a, a new sanitation system that essentially collects human waste from, from uh, households that have been, because of the earthquake, disconnected from any municipal sewage system. Uh, collected that waste in 50, 50 gallon drums, hauls it to a central industrial facility, which is be behind barbed wire fence, in order to try to contain the pathogens and the spread of disease. Um, and then began to compost at massive scale that human waste. Um, a piece of the story that I wanna highlight here is that she then began to be able to sell that compost for agricultural applications. If I understand, uh, um, if I have my story straight, originally it was and might still be largely for forestry applications, including with the company Heineken. Who, who who began to value the the you know the bioavailable nutrients embedded in this waste stream, which had heretofore been uh, being tossed out to sea. So on one hand, soil is helping reduce the incidence of disease and death in a place devastated by natural disaster and suffering poverty to begin with, and combining that with a commercial enterprise producing a uh, nutrient-rich uh, compost stream that a big commercial companies value. Uh, so I'm very thankful for Sasha and her work. A couple more examples, um, and this is it for my examples. Um, we could give a bunch more, but I, I'm trying to give just a wide flavor. Um, 
uh, down in the Navajo Nation, a place called Talani Lake Enterprises. So, so I get to work a lot right now. Uh, I have the great privilege of working with, with a number of Navajo and other Native American community organizers. Uh, we call ourselves nourishment enterprisers. And one of them I just wanted to point out is that uh, inspired in part by the visit of Sylvia from Zambia, who I mentioned earlier, but also really, um, really based on the, 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 the cultural integrity of, of, of the people in these communities um, uh, and their, their drive to reestablish their own health and welfare and sovereignty over their own well-being. Um, uh, they have a number of programs that have some greenhouses, some growing practices, some youth training programs, some community outreach, different things. Um, one of their young organizers uh, combined all those pieces into the proposal to create a, um, a pop-up cafe, call it a food truck, call it a cafe, where uh, they could begin, the young people who run the enterprise could begin to prepare uh, native foods, native food recipes for both distribution in their own communities and for commercial sale, including to tourists and others who travel through their area. Um, uh, and a really important aspect of understanding the power of this kind of model, which goes all the way back to our start with Brendan in Ireland and the sheep farming, is that uh, the real reason uh, Burrell, who started it initially, uh, uh, was trying to do it was to was to provide in a path for the passion and the energy, a constructive path for the young people in his communities. And so he needed a way, he wanted to encourage them to garden. Just encouraging people to garden is a beautiful thing that doesn't always work if it doesn't have a, a systemic you know, thread, a, a system constructed around it that supports and connects uh, and reinforces uh, those people, right? Um, some of us like to go sit in the garden all day by ourselves, but not everybody is as introverted as me. Um, so the social connection was important. Uh, creating recipes which required the young people to grow their own traditional foods, which gives them a connection to their own traditional growing practices, which gives them a connection back both to the physiological health and the cultural connections and the identity of a regenerative, of a sustainable, of a, of a moral and ethical lifestyle that contrasts a lot with the modern society they've been drawn into, which sort of, um, let's say, uh, you know, I'll say conflicts with a lot of those values, right? Um, so now you see uh, the idea of a, of a commercial cafe, it looks like, to the, to the tourist, the Grand Canyon tourist who wants to pull up and, and try this interesting Navajo food. Uh, but much deeper things going on. Um, now I have to say, uh, to be transparent, um, that in the pandemic, this this initiative, not Tolani Lake, but the the pop up cafe, really got hit hard by the pandemic. Um, and some some other good things and bad things have happened. I'd be happy to talk more, or perhaps if my native colleagues uh, would want to to arrange separate conversations to share insights about what a post-pandemic food economy, nourishment economy can look like in communities. We could discuss that, um, um, but I wanted to put up this example um, to illustrate the systemic threads and the pieces of how the cultural and the biological and the financial aspects of the economy work, can work together. Uh, finally, uh, go back to Belgium. I just wanted to point out this woman, Geneviève Moreau, uh, a pharmacist who did a ton of research over a decade, starting a decade ago, around uh, the nutritional losses at sort of each step between uh, seed and soil and harvesting and storage and transport and, and distribution and preparation and cooking and consumption of your food. So she re she studied, you know, extensively produced. I think it was nearly ten thousand pages of documentation of nutritional losses, 
And based on that, established a marketing label at cookbooks and nutritional centers. And I don't even know what else she's up to today. Um, I hope this story sounds familiar. So a part of my goal in, 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 in gathering with you today, I'm gonna to go back here. I'm gonna go back to these, what we call pivotal, pivotal characteristics to begin with. I'll come back to the goal, but again, they all seem to be combining financial, social, and environmental benefits, right? Into circular systems. They escalate the vitality, both of the people and the ecosystems where they operate. They foster a sense of agency and creativity in people and communities. They create an ongoing stream of innovation. And they all have a common thread, of whether it's the intent or just an observation of a piece of what they're doing, of, of linking nutrition in people and soils together. Um, a piece of my goal in, in, in presenting all of this is to suggest, is to say, is to share with Dan, as we discuss sometimes in all of you, that um, the economics that are going to come out of what all of us are working on here, from the bionutrient meter to other farming and food management practices, you know, the, the economics as they play out, aren't really uh, up for debate. In my world, it is working with first a few, and then a few dozen, and then a couple hundred of these, of finding these, 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 these enterprises around the world, all of which are systemic, some of which are small in scale, some of which are, to me, pretty big in scale, Kamako and Zambia being the biggest. Um, uh, with its 220,000 small farmer network. Um, uh, the results that they're producing are not up for debate, right? The science underlying what's going on might be up for clarification, illustration, and sometimes for debate. Um, but it's quite clear that each and every one of them, of these, is um, is linking financial, biological, and social cultural forces in a way that are creating dynamic, truly regenerative uh, forces in their in their communities and in some cases in their entire countries. Um, I put our picture from the start back on the slide, just to remind us that it, you know a, a, a white slide with some words isn't really the point. It's how our mind might process or grasp grapple with uh, some of what we're, we're, we're seeing and trying to argue and promote, um, but it's human beings taking actions that, that make the difference here. Uh, there's, a, um, there's a sketch of an economic model I'm gonna share. I have about 10 more minutes of overview and I'm just gonna hard stop and then see where any of you or Dan wanna refocus or have questions or, or, or turn off the computer because because you're not into what I'm sharing um, or whatever. Um, um, but the economics of this are important to me as someone trained in environmental economics and so, someone who spent approximately 30 years trying to build sustaining regenerative enterprises around the world, not always around nutrient systems, right? Um, so we call this the, the, the economic model. It's 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 rough, but it, you know this this chart is six years old at this point, um, and I put it up just to illustrate what I think we see going on in economic terms, in terms of the forces that motivate individuals to behave in ways that result in regenerative, enriching rather than extractive behaviors. Uh, we basically see the ecological or environmental, it's called sector. That's language we use sometimes in Western society, right? We see farmers and food producers, we see food consumers, and we see health, health care, health and development wellness institutions. Uh, but we call them practical environmentalists, regenerative farmers, vitality-minded food producers, wellness-focused health and development in industries. And what we see, if you, if you look at it, if you look at the pattern between these enterprises, is what I've called here the supply of nutrients and nutrition and nourishment going in one direction 
from the earth to the people, nutrients, a uh, scientific construct becoming nutrition, a, a, a health healthcare construct becoming nourishment, uh, what to me is an economic construct, a financial, biological, and sociocultural nourishment. And what we see flowing back the other direction are the incentives that drive the whole cycle. When, when someone can see enough of these benefits and manage it, to figure out how to make them tangible enough to sustain their initiative, you see financial, social, and cultural forces. All three of those are economic, right? Um, financial is a piece of it, but economics doesn't mean money. It means in this case, uh, how, is, how are relationships built? How is wealth distributed in society? Uh, what is motivating people to behave and establish relationships with each other that transfer resources uh, in successful ways, in ways that enrich life on earth rather than deplete it? So we see financial, social, and cultural incentives in every one of the examples I just gave you. We could flip back and look at what are the financials. Okay, now in those cases, are the financials sufficient to sustain the enterprise? Uh, not in most of the cases. And in those cases where they are, one of the interesting things we see is that the financials reflect revenue being drawn in from two or three, usually two or three different sources. So Kamako in Zambia uh, is drawing in revenue from selling commercial food product and selling carbon on international markets and some contributions for elephant conservation. Uh, Probably most of us with our whiteboard in business school wouldn't have mapped out a business model that said, go sell food, carbon, and elephant conservation. Um, and yet those are the forces we see, uh, several, several threads of revenue combining because when you connect to nutrient cycles or steward them the way most of the people I think at this conference understand, so many goods are produced for society, but, but it can be distracting, it can be chaotic, you, you can't rely on any one of them. So a piece of the economic challenge, I think, for all of us is to, is to, is to figure out how to, uh, how to make practical and tangible enough of the benefit streams that each and every one of us can uh, construct our own initiative um, uh, that, that grows in these ways. So this is the economic model we've been working with for about six years. Um, uh, it's high time to update it because we, you know, when Dan and I met four years ago, not a lot of people were talking about this stuff. You know, When I first put this diagram on paper six years ago, very few people were talking about this. When we started seeing it reflected in those enterprises, like the ones I just shared 10 years ago, I was all alone. I mean, I mean, really the momentum and the trend here is so exciting and, and I haven't been able to keep up with it. Um, you know, we, we, we coined the term nourishment economy based on this pattern about six years ago. Uh, it may or may not be the right term. It is very intentional. I can explain more why we use that term, but the fact that others are beginning to use the phrase nourishment economy is pretty exciting because it was a pretty lonely business a bunch of years ago. And I'm really happy to be having the chance to even share with all of you today. Again, I'm gonna put the, the picture of the people under the economic model, right? It's, it's the people who are indigenously approaching all the benefits that come out of connecting the nutrients and nutrition between soils and people. It's the, it's the humans, the people, the change makers in community, the farmers, the entrepreneurs, whether you're a business entrepreneur or a social entrepreneur, it's them, or hopefully it's you, who are saying, wait a minute, if we connect nutrient cycles these way, all these things happen in forests and biodiversity and wildlife and water and food quality, ecosystem resilience, health, economic development, and who understand their own local context well enough to grab whichever of those benefits they can find partners in and develop markets for and with to make tangible, to begin to grow their enterprise. It's what we call indigenous. It's very different than centrally managed top-down design and then implemented somewhere by somebody else. 
that's a piece of the pattern here. Um, I'm gonna offer one more set of these sort of intellectual observations. Uh, and I apologize in advance for the small font and sketchiness. I just pulled this together recently and haven't had time to formalize it. But what I wanna do finally is point out in the spirit of, of this idea that uh, so many good things are produced, but in the world I work in, it's often local change-minded people, community organizers and entrepreneurial thinkers and doers who, who are able to figure out how to, how to, how to grab and, and, and get traction with those. Um, I wanted to list off, uh, again, a, a number of what we call nutrient value chains, um, hashtag nutrient value chains. Uh, on Twitter, we tweet. Uh, every time we see a new example where this whole cycle seems to be in place, we tweet it. Um, please go tweet them also. Use the hashtag nutrient value chains. These are nutrient value chains the way we think about them. Uh, what I did was I looked at 35 of our, you know, the enterprises, the initiatives in our, in our, in our loose coalition and, and, and studied from the economic analyst perspective, not what are the benefits that are being produced, but what are the incentives that are driving their success? And so I'm going to read down this list because it is tiny font. Uh, I apologize. Um, uh, if we had the resources, we could formalize this a little bit. Maybe we'll try to do that anyway. Um, so out of 35, out of a sample size of 35 of these enterprises, from big to small, uh, in this chart from top to bottom, what we see is the first column to the right, how many of those enterprises are tapping this nutrient value chain as a piece of their success formula. And then the two other columns to the right are, uh, does this particular nutrient value chain have a financial return attached to it for these enterprises? Um, and or does it have a social and cultural driver, economic driver attached to it? Um, it's an interesting observation to, to, to think about how those two work together. Again, they are uh, consistently paired in our work in Western Ireland, we saw it was the financial return for the sheep farmer in combination with the cultural integrity of bio, wildflower biodiversity stewardship, combined with the economic vitality of the community that makes the whole enterprise work, right? These are unconventional, but they're very powerful. Um, so reading down the list, and then I'll just stop. Uh, uh, 16 of them have differentiated markets for nutritional or cultural foods. Uh, 16 of them have fostered a sense of agency or change making in their communities and have managed to channel that as an incentive. So we create local change makers and that's one of the forces that helps sustain our institution. 16 out of 35. Um, it may seem like an abstract or a nice idea if you can run your business. No, in fact, it's core to making the business succeed in, in 16 of these 35 cases. Um, provide employment, um, increase food security in the case of crisis is what 15 of the 35 are doing, which has both a financial and a social cultural driver attached to it in terms of why they succeed. Diversify the economic activity of the players that um, uh, provide healthy inputs back to a landscape in terms of the composting, the rich soils or the pollinators, 13 of the 35 do that. Um, reinforce positive cultural identity uh, is a very powerful force. Um, again, it, 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 we may think of it as in Western capitalist terms as a, a marketing approach, but it's powerful. It is, it is in fact driving the success. So you might ask yourself, how, how does whatever you're doing play to people's sense of identity and understanding of themselves and their history, their heritage and the integrity around that. And, and in appealing to that, we might even help uh, break some of the economic forces that are separating us from our own cultural identities and heritages. Um, but I said today's presentation wasn't supposed to be advocacy, so I won't go there. Um, sell food crops directly, protect wildlife and biodiversity, uh, increase landscape resilience, distribute quality foods to communities in need is, is a powerful force. And it turns out it's actually a pretty good business to be in, in some cases. Um, 
provide value added products rather than just selling your crops straight up. Uh, foster social emotional healing, including specifically, so nine of the 35 address one way or another traumas and addictions that people in society face by helping people through the foods they consume connect with their own values and identities, their heritage, their sense of place, creating a foundation from which those same people are able to stabilize what they're struggling with in life and come back to their own surface uh, more centered. Um, it's, it's really powerful stuff if you're willing to go there. Uh, and it's not at all sort of a, a, a tangential force. It's, it's front and center in how a lot of these really regenerative enterprises in the world are, are making things happen. Um, convene diverse stakeholders, re reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Seven of the 35 have managed to channel greenhouse gas emission reductions it, as a driver for a piece of their success. Uh, reduce risks to water systems, reduce input costs for farmers uh, in terms of feedstocks or fertilizers, foster talent in society, reduce pollution, reduce diseases, improve healing from illnesses, generate tourism, uh, defeat extractive threats to local land or community. Let's go back to Kamako and Zambia one more time. Uh, when I first visited about seven years ago, there was a lot of uh, cotton farming from other countries, mostly in East Asia, coming into the region as a cash crop. And uh, largely through Kamako's operations and its partnership with local communities and local farmers, uh, there is no longer any cotton being grown in that 40,000 square mile region, any extractive cotton, which is sort of controlled where people are paid basic labor rates to apply uh, heavy chemicals to the land in order to extract a, a cash crop to be exported somewhere else. It's gone. I saw tons of cotton farming when I was there first. You don't see it anymore. And it's really exciting from my perspective. Um, Okay, reduce costs to large institutions. I just, I wanted to be comprehensive. So now we're down to what we see only amongst two or three or four of the, of the enterprises, but they're still relevant. They're important. Um, generate data, which has financial value for others. Strengthen a company's relations with its staff or its surrounding communities. The CSR payback or HR payback in your own company is, is a real tangible, important driver of, of, of a lot of institutions, right? And finally, we did see Garbage to Garden creating something new uh, that I hadn't understood before, which is soap from the uh, stream of inputs collected from household food wastes. And there's the pictures of our people because none of this exists without people doing these things. They don't happen in the abstract. Um, my final observation, um, I want to return to the point I tried to offer at the start, which is that each of us probably sits in a different seat. The implications to me of this economic uh, reality uh, might be different if you are a farmer or grower, or if you are an investor, or if you are a philanthropist. You know, if you're a philanthropist, I'd love to see you adopt a, um, a, a, a nutrient cycle, you know, filter to uh, how you support uh, different uh, charitable initiatives. Um, if you're an investor, I think you should understand that the fundamentals here, the economic fundamentals are really, really strong. Um, and I think BFA and others know that at this point. Um, um, if you're a community organizer, a social entrepreneur, an activist, you know, look around in part, maybe you're already doing this, just look at the nutrient cycles in your own neighborhood, in your community, in your landscape. That's part of the implication is, is amongst all the different ways you could you could look at how to try, try to create a uh, ethical, moral, ecologically sustainable, uh, humanely uh, uh, viable enterprise or life, look for nutrient cycles between people and earth, look where they're broken, fix them, and look at all the good things that happen as a result. That's one of the implications of this, um, I think, of the set of, of, of examples. Um, if you're a public policymaker, you know, I'm, I'm trained at pretty high levels in public policy and environmental economics. Um, you know, I think there's a principle, a nourishment principle to be applied here that, uh, that has integrity at the highest levels of academia, but hasn't 
really been developed. And if uh, we might develop public policies, whether it's in a, in a Western American democratic or other uh, sense or a, a culturally distinct approach, you know, um, having the principle of nourishment, of regeneration, of, the, of not being willing to separate the biological and the social, cultural, and the financial from each other uh, is the kind of guiding principle for a lot of policy development that I think really leads to paradigm shifts in society. So I hope that each of us can listen to and react to all of this, you know, from our own, from our own seat and share that, keep sharing that with each other. Um, that's it. Here's the equation that led to the logo for my organization. Nutrients times nutrition times biocultural financial nourishment equals nourish to the nth degree. Thank you all for listening today. Thank you very much, David. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I, I wonder if you can, I, I feel like the, 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 the place where you started in all this process with, the, I think it was Ashoka, um, and what the questions were that you were asking, um, at least in, as you've explained it to me, helps tie all these pieces together. Would you mind just giving us two or three minutes on that? I'm um, just where the, where the question was that you started this, this, this journey with? Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, yeah, so so I worked with Ashoka for about ten or twelve years, um, um, and the question we begin with. So Ashoka is the organization which coined the term social entrepreneur nearly forty years ago, and uh, and set out to uh, to find those kinds of individuals who who were systemic and innovative and ethical in society under the theory of change that it's almost every meaningful social change or paradigm shift we can look at through the course of history uh, roots back to somebody, some individual being themselves who has this personality type, <laughs> who is who's sort of like a systems thinker, you know, obsessively ethical, obsessively like, I'm just gonna make stuff happen in the world. Yeah. And, right? Mm. Um, we received some funding. I mean, we solicited and received some funding to go out specifically and look for those kinds of individuals uh, who were somehow tweaking society in rural economies. That was it. So go to rural economies, rural communities, and look for systems change that was happening, trace it backwards to who was making it happen, and um, and recognize them, support them, work with them, and look at them to see if there were any patterns amongst them. And that's yeah. it. And this is the pattern. This is, so we didn't start by saying, let's promote nutrition. <laughs> we started by saying, what's driving successful paradigm shift in the world? And my view of it, of it is, uh, it's people who are making tangible the benefits, all the great things that happen when you connect nutrition in land with nutrition in people. It's obviously a you know a theme that at the BFA we are <laughs> happy to happy to put forth. It aligns with our objectives, but I certainly you know have seen in my life this how many people there are out there doing the good work, not you know looking for fame and fortune, but just because it's 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 in their gut. Um, and so, yeah, these models about how it can work and what others are doing and, and how we can learn from each other um, and hopefully integrate more proactively, I think is, is very inspiring. Um, there's a couple of questions here, but I'd love to give people a chance to post others if they've got them. Uh, Sherry actually is not a question. She says, I'm not able to stay for the questions, but love the presentation. Thank you. You're inspiring me to create my company using these thoughtful business models. Um, Thank Isabel, you. Uh, who I think you know, uh, says, appreciate this very hopeful presentation. What is your organization's role in starting or sustaining these enterprises? Thanks, Dan. I'm sorry. I was I I, I heard a blip when you said I might know who asked this question. Who did you say? Uh, Isabel. Isabel. Thanks. From I uh, think New Mexico so Healthy Soil Coalition. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, we didn't start today to talk about my organization. I'm happy to do that, but that you know that's not what we wanted to sit and do. Um, in brief, uh, we have a mission. 
which is to create this kind of vitality in the world and four strategies we pursue. Uh, one of which is to, is to look for and partner with and support these kind of change makers because we believe and we see in the pattern amongst them that they're, they're leading the rest of us, right? Um, and so more, more and better and faster, you know, and whatever we can do to help and support. Let me mention the other three and I'll return to that one for a second, what we actually do there. But yeah. I wanna highlight number two, you know, what I got to say in five minutes, uh, Dan gave me on stage four years ago was one of the other four strategies is that we identified nine years ago is help society come up with measurement and metrics around nutrient density or nutrient spectrum to serve as the basis for transacting in food quality. Okay, that's a nine-year-old statement in my world. Very specific. <laughs> Very technical. <laughs> <laughs> and so, well, and so, so how can I operationalize that? I try to operationalize that by supporting those those individuals or organizations I find who are who are pursuing that. And Dan Kittredge, here we are today, and 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 Greg and the the RSI team and others, right? Um, the other two, let me mention without going deep, but these are these are the pivot points we identified analytically through the work. One is initiatives that foster young talent that understands these principles from, from an early age. And so that often involves working with school systems um, and others. But the, the word young is important because it's not just about the future, it's about realizing that, that young people tend to penetrate their communities way faster, way more effectively than us old people. So if you can get a bunch of young people motivated around these issues and send them back home, they they make stuff happen like way more effectively with their parents and others than some of us who sit and analyze and talk like we we know what we're talking about right and the fourth the fourth is um is when we do see governance principles aligned with what i call the nourishment principle go governance in society then very powerful things happen because because the basis for governance decisions becomes all of this and there aren't very many examples but where they are they're really powerful um, Isabel, looping back then to, to what we do, um, uh, the pandemic kind of disrupted the stuff, um, but I do two things. One is connect and convene these, I would call them the nourishment enterprisers with each other. So me and my team are in a, the unique position of being able to look across a lot of this and find connect points, we think, not where they're doing the same thing, but where it looks like what Sylvia is doing over there and Malimu's doing over here sure would fit together really well, <laughs> but they're the entrepreneurs, not us. So we bring them together um, uh, in different ways at different times around different themes, right? Virtually or in person. And uh, one thing we learned to do in Isabel's neighborhood in Albuquerque, New Mexico, about three years ago was to do this and invite a bunch of local community members as well. So I convened a two-day Nourishment Economies Action Summit around the connection between restaurants, restaurants and food and um, yeah, restaurants, recipes, books, cookbooks, those chefs, right? That theme. And um, brought in 10 of the folks you've just heard me talk about and invited 10, 10 people from, from both urban and rural Navajo and Hopi communities who sat with us for two days together. And out of that convening has come, you know, three years and going of strong relationships, new strategic initiatives, community startups. Um, um, Isabel, you probably know James and Joyce Skeet from Spirit Farm in Van de Wagen, New Mexico. They're a very valued partner now. I'm privileged to work with them. We share so many insights together. And uh, Finally, I'm, I'm in a position um, to respond, and I want to stress that I'm responding to those forces sometimes to, to suggest collaborations and to try to fundraise. So sometimes we, you know, I put together funding proposals on behalf of a group of these enterprisers to do something new, to try something new uh, together. Um, in addition, aside from the financial piece, we convene community with each other. Just having others to connect with is a very powerful thing. When you're a social entrepreneur, you're often out there alone in the world or you're talking to people, but you don't really have a lot of peers to sit around and like kick back or take, take the hits with. <laughs> um, so we do a lot of 
internal, you know, in, inside the studio, convening, sharing, networking, and trying to share knowledge with each other. Let me point out that on our website, um, there's an email sign up box. Uh, the website is www.nourishn.com. If you sign up, then you'll see a fairly informal bi-monthly email, just plain text where we share insights or new actions with each other. Um, Wonderful. Yeah, just a, a, a networking hub for those of like mind and, and uh, <laughs> yeah. different, different specific action, but generally aligned, aligned purpose. Beautiful. Um, Isabel says, fascinating connections. Thank you. Great. Um, we've got about a little bit less than 10 minutes left. Uh, so if anyone who is on the call, feel, feel free. Um, let me, can I point out one thing, Dan? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I want to, I, I want to do this just in the, in the sense of um, the sort of storytelling, right? And, 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 and a lot of us grapple with how to justify or rationalize or explain this line of action we're taking in the world to those bigger forces that are out there, right? Um, who, who insist that we be able to- I've given up on trying to explain. <laughs> just keep... Well, so- Yes, keep... Uh, <laughs> I guess I guess what I want to do is encourage you and others from my own experience, which is like, yeah, but if you're telling real stories of real people with real impact, you know, we'll figure out how to explain it, but but hang on to the reality, right? So something which I'm I'm both proud of and I grapple with in my own mind is that, you know, uh five years ago I got I got invited to chair the nutrition panel at the World Food Prize. And the, the Borlaug Dialogue, a large mainstream corporate, for the most part, uh, at least until recent years, um, you know, uh, uh, centrally managed, you know, food system initiative. And where a lot of people argue for things that some of us don't argue for, for GMO, for, for chemicals and this and that and the other thing. And, and I'm not arguing against all of that per se, but why did they invite me? <laughs> and they invited me because we have real examples of real impact that are delivering nutrition to people in creative, unconventional ways that break the model. <laughs> and we're not saying we know how to explain it all. We're not saying <laughs> we know every scientific aspect, but we're saying this is reality. These are, you know, human and the earth are alive as a result of this kind of action. And by pursuing that kind of action, Others begin to take notice. You know, don't don't let them back you into a corner and explain yourself before you go do something. Please. This whole concept about externalized costs and maximizing economic profit by externalizing other costs, the social and the environmental and things like that. Effectively, what you're showing is that you can be entirely profitable and still, you know, and in, in, internalize those aspects and have them be beneficial as well. I think it's or, or, or improved symbiotically as well. I think that aligns to a large degree with what Ray has been talking about as, at his presentations over the um, over this conference. And I, um, I was I was struck by by um, Pierre's Pierre Riel's presentation about um, what Blue Blancour is and their network of you know scientists and consumers and growers and companies. All working together in this model of of synergy and the label and you know two billion euros a year in sales, um, ten percent of the eggs in France or whatever the numbers were. It was like, you know, these models are out there of ways that we can work systematically in a harmonious and and symbiotic and economically beneficial manner. Um, uh, they don't always get the uh, <laughs> the. Uh, top billing in the in New York Times or, or, or wherever um, because of, uh, you know, economic forces that are out there. But certainly there are lots of examples of this kind of work that is, that is, that does work. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, it's powerful. It's real. And um, I guess the other thing I've learned, um, again, as a classically trained policy analyst and economist, right, is, you know, it, it the real impact on the ground isn't about whether it can be rationalized on a piece of paper and explained intellectually all the time. Yeah. That, that 
is important. It is helpful. It helps human society proceed in terms of our knowledge. Um, but it's very important not to not to assume that therefore everything needs to be able to be explained rationally on a piece of paper before you can go do it. <laughs> To the point about you know indigenous cultures doing a very good job working harmoniously with nature, life, the land to build vitality and fecundity and economic viability and health and things like that. Not using any quote unquote Western scientific methods, not having you know peer review and <laughs> replicated randomized trials, but certainly getting the effect um, to a, a degree much beyond what it seems like most of us are able to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a, a big difference there between what you can quote unquote scientifically improve, prove and and what works. But yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, I think there's a connection. Um, but, I, you know, I, let me let me say I'm, I'm really, really excited about one one line of work that I get to be involved in uh, now, <clears throat> which actually involved Rehi in a, in a, in a conversation recently, along with a, an economist from from uh, Peru from Incan communities, traditional Incan communities in Peru, and another Navajo enterpriser uh, about the convergence of language, uh, the apparent convergence, the opportunity for convergence of language around uh, what I'm calling nourishment psychoeconomics, what we can refer to, and you know, we can get very academic in the economics. We can go into neoclassical versus Marxist and socialist versus, we can do all of that, but we're beginning to say, yeah, forces that create value that people internalize rather than externalize, right? These are Western economic terms. On the other side, what we see is uh, a clear relationship with a number of indigenous knowledge and wisdom frameworks that reflect the exact same forces, if we can say it that way. And I'm not willing to put one before the other. I prefer to say, look, there's something going on here. And, and uh, it's really powerful. And it results, it relates to the health and life of the earth and the health and life of the atmosphere and the health and life of the human being. And the health and life of the human being is both a physiological thing, but it's also a spiritual, emotional, and cultural thing. That may mean something different to every individual, and it works. We don't yeah. have to try to argue about it. It works. Make it happen, people. Yeah. Um, so. We've only got a couple minutes left. Lenora has a, has a point here. This probably will be the last one. Uh, seems like there's many orgs, i.e., um, that focus on food sovereignty, are aligned with this mission, but not necessarily present present through a nutritional lens. And wonder if you network with them to, um, if you network with them to exponentially build our coalition. One you may be familiar with, like uh, localfutures.org. Um, so I do. Yeah. Thank you. Some, some, and this movement really two two observations. It, the momentum is built so fast in the last couple of years that I can't keep up. So I'm. I mean, I don't have the resources. You know, I'll put out a call for funding support for what we do. Please, whoever's out there that takes an interest in this, because there's opportunity for collaboration and connection that I'm not able to act on now because there's so much of it happening. Um, uh, the other piece is that, um, and so some of it, yes, but not enough of it. Um, uh, the other is that I get a lot of traction when discussing the economics of food sovereignty. So I've had the really great honor for five or six years to be working with indigenous, some indigenous food system organizers around the world. Um, because we got invited in, because our, our framework and our stories make sense to a number of Native peoples who come at it, maybe from a different starting point, but find the resonance. And uh, I'm involved right now in, in some very interesting some, you know, conversations with a lot of creative tension around the difference between food sovereignty and the economics of food sovereignty. Yeah. yeah and they're not the same thing. And, and so my thread in that conversation is to sit back as the Middle class American white guy, right? That's that's who I am. That's my background, you know. And say, look, I think I want to see food sovereignty institutionalized as a force, not as a not as a political force where you have to go beat the streets eighty hours a week and argue to make it happen, but where society and systems are constructed so that food sovereignty 
is the baseline. It's the reality, right? Yeah. Uh, so. And sovereignty of a, probably of a few other natures as well would be yes. you know, symptomatic <laughs> or symbiotic with that. Yeah. yeah, that's a wonderful point to end on. Um, yeah, great. Any any final final thoughts or that's that's a that's a that's a good high point. Well, I think is it. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I I love the chance to talk and share and 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 uh, it's the connectivity that makes it all happen. Beautiful. So, no, so keep keep it up, please. <laughs> you too. Thanks, David. Take care. Uh, yeah.